I can convert to this. Okay. Hey, the candy man delivers. All right. Thank you. That's pretty wild that he supplied that because we were low on candy. I was in the office and I was actually like, Lord, like George Mueller prayed for milk for the breakfast. I'm praying now we have candy provided. And there we go. Candy's provided. So that's pretty cool. Um, well, you know, um, we've got a lot going on in our world, our country. Um, we need to pray for Israel. As you all know, they're being under attack. We need to pray for our military. We don't know how that can have a domino effect on our military. Um, I have a son that's been deployed you know, in, in Bahrain, so um, some of you may have family members as well in the military or know of people. So we have a lot of things to pray over. And connected to that is we live in a very chaotic uh, world, a very stressful producing world. And that's actually what I'll be preaching on in a little bit will be on um, how to reduce your stress level. So I'm glad you came today if you've been dealing with stress or have had much stress lately because that's a real relevant and important and pertinent topic um, of the hour. So if you would, we're just going to take a little time. I don't know if we can have some instrumental music or not, Denise, but um, we're just going to go to the Lord. It's very important, I believe, at the beginning of our service to let our heart get settled and allow ourselves to start to work against the distractions that have been going on and continue to go on and try to plague our mind and just come together as a body of believers, a body of Christ, and getting quiet and just turning our hearts to God at this hour in hopes, um, and when I say hope, it's with certainty that God will speak to us today in the middle of our chaotic world and get to give us peace amidst the storm, amidst the trials and tribulations of life, that you can receive spiritual power no matter what you're dealing with or what you face because of the power of prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit that we have access to and we're able to connect to and receive um, a, divine, a divine infusion today. So let's go to the Lord and just let's put our hearts on Him. His Spirit is here. He's everywhere. He's here. Let's now turn to Him and pray and ask Him what He wants us to receive today. Help us come now at this hour, a very important hour, probably one of the most important hours we ever experience in life, one that we're coming here together as believers in you. We turn to you now, the God who touched us at a point in our life in the past for those of us that have been saved and born again and regenerated by a touch that only you, the God of heaven, could do and perform and to supernaturally save us cleanse us and forgive us of our sins and enable us to hear from you and walk with you and to help us to overcome anything and everything that we will face in this life. And so we come together in agreement, Lord, that you are God and you're worthy of worship. You're worthy to come and invest in, pursue and seek. So many things to pray about, God. We pray, Father, for um, our country. We pray, Father, for a spiritual revival, spiritual renewal, spiritual return to you. We pray, God, for uh, Israel, the country that you chose to birth this Savior through, and that the end times revelation speaks about massive amounts of Jewish Jews coming to Christ for the first time, becoming Messianic Jews. And so we pray for them and our role in their conversion and our role through prayer and Perhaps there's some Jews living around us or near us that we can have a burden for and grow our hearts to love more and to connect with them and share the gospel of 
Jesus Christ too. God, we pray for those in the military. We don't know how uh, world events right now can affect our military very quickly. So we pray for those that are in the military and for our military. We pray for a strengthening of their spirits and for those that don't know you, they come to know you through uh, stress and fear and difficulties that oftentimes causes us to turn to you. I pray, Father, for our church body, wherever we are at spiritually, wherever we come from this past week, whatever we've been experiencing this past month or past year, that you would, Father, uh, refresh us and renew us, revitalize us, and that we would be uh, stronger in our faith or to grow in our faith. And if the enemy's after anything, he's after making us less effective, dismantling our faith and throwing things at us to cause us to be depressed and disillusioned and down. So Father, we pray that we would grow in our faith every day of every month, of every year that we have remaining. May we be a church on the rise and on the move with you. We join you, Father, in what you're trying to do today and reveal and to share to embolden us and empower us with your spiritual power. So we pray, dear God, now that you enable our hearts to be opened enough to receive a word from you, inspiration, encouragement. Father, wherever we're at, help us to open our hearts to you, hear you, know you, experience you, and encounter, to, and encounter with you today, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, good morning. Let's continue in our time of worship. Um, we just spent time talking to God through prayer, but God loves to hear our worship to him. Um, and so let's reflect on the words that we're singing as we join our hearts and minds in letting him know that today is all about him and this time that we're together. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come fly
just experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of another one. You're good. Oh, 
right, it's that time. It's one of my favorite times during the hour. It's when we uh, off, allow our kids to come forward. Any kids here to here this morning? Come on down, all kids, any kids, all children. Come on down. We love kids here, don't we, Crossroads? Amen. All right, it's good having you all here. Hey, buddy. Hey there. <laughs> hey there. Wow. Oh, yeah. All right. I like those ears. All right. All right, go, girl. All right, hey there. Oh, wow, what a beautiful looking group of kids here this morning. Wow. Praise the Lord. Man, I just want to just have you all stand up and give you all a big group hug. Uh, you know, God loves kids. Huh? You want to do a group hug? All right, get on, stand up. Let's all come on in the center, group hug. Come on, y'all, stand up. Let's see if we can do a group hug. God loves little kids. Come on. All right, you give a hug. All right. Come on, everybody. Center in. Center in. All right, here we go. This is our huddle, our spiritual huddle. We're getting ready. We're getting ready to be infused by some serious spirituality. All right. On the three, let's say, let's go, God. One, two, three. Let's, let's go, God. God. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the idea, Happy. All right. <laughs> You know, we serve a, a hugging kind of God. He loves, he loves you all so much. You know, when, there's going to be times you may doubt that or question that, but I want to send a message to you that there is, um, there is no doubt there's a God in heaven who loves you today. That's why you're here today. I believe he drew you here because he wanted you to feel his love. And so I want to talk to you um, about this uh, little devotion here. What, what's your guys' favorite food? You guys like to eat? What's your favorite food? Anybody have a favorite food? What do you like? Pizza. Pizza. Anybody else? Favorite food? Anybody else? Mrs. Chris's, Mrs. Chris's cobbler. cobbler. Mrs. Chris's cobbler. All right. Your dad's steak. Your dad makes a good steak. All right. We'll be over at your house for supper tonight. T-bone steak and ribs. Ready to go. <laughs> Ribeye. All right. Anybody else? <laughs> Bring your own. Anybody else? Favorite food? What's your favorite food? What's that? Chicken. Chicken and rice? No, chicken fries. Chicken fries. Where from? <laughs> okay, chicken fries. All right. Pizza. Pizza. Another pizza fan. All right. Anybody else? Pizza. pizza. Honey chicken with some fried rice. Honey chicken with some fried rice? Yay. Okay. Pizza. All right. Another pizza fan. A lot of pizza fans. Pizza. All right. All right, you guys, uh, hopefully you guys uh, get pizza ordered tonight uh, from your favorite pizza place. Papa John's, Pizza Hut, Domino's, I don't know where your favorite pizza. Cowabunga, where's that place? No. <laughs> Cowabunga Pizza, right? All right. All right, we got to get going here because, listen, we got a whole service here ahead. But anyway, um, listen, what if um, we can open up the church doors and as soon as you walked out of church, your favorite food was hanging on trees? So like your favorite sliced pizza was hanging from the branches and you could just pull it off the tree and it was hot, fresh off the vine, right? Um, Supreme pizza or pepperoni, whatever you like. I don't know. How about Twinkie tree? You wish there was a Twinkie tree out here? Anybody like Twinkies? Are there still Twinkie fans out there? Twinkies? They don't make enough, with cre enough cream anymore, though. They, they, I think they reduced it. I think they're trying to save money. But I would like personally a Twinkie tree plant out in our front yard of the church so I can go out there, grab me a Twinkie off the vine, but it's double cream than what they offer in the stores, right? It's all about ratio. Eating is all about ratio. You've got to have the right ratio to make it great, right? Well, anyway, there's a story, a time in the Bible where the Israelites were crossing the desert. And so you can imagine crossing a desert. It's going to be, what, hot, right? It's going to be heat, a uh, long walk. They had to walk a long ways from where they were in Egypt all the way to Israel. It's a long walk. So they're hot. They're, um, you know, probably um, stressed out from hunger pains. And they were even complaining. In fact, listen to one of the complaints they did to Moses. It says the people started to grumble and complain against Moses and the leaders and his brother Aaron. Uh, they said, we had it better when we were back in Egypt. You know, we had it better, uh, the place we were used to living at. At least we had plenty to eat. God, you have brought us out here in the desert to starve to death. What's the point of that, right? It'd be like, um, I don't know what your favorite candy is, uh, but uh, it'd be like, let's say... Um, I just started saying, hey guys, you know what? Instead of candy today, I got blueberry oatmeal. You guys, you know? Blueberry oatmeal. Here you go. Blueberry oatmeal. Right? <laughs> there you go. And you get a box. There's nothing in it. But anyway. So <laughs> Would you guys be disappointed? 
You guys like blueberry oatmeal, right? That's a lot better than Twix candy bars and M&Ms and Skittles, right? Way better, right? It's all about righteous eating, guys. It's all about healthy eating, right? Yeah, right? Well, see, they were doing that. They were complaining. And so um, God heard the complaints. You know what he did? He supernaturally performed a miracle. You know what he did? He sent somehow, some people call it magic, but there's no magic in the Bible. He, God supernaturally, miraculously provided quail, like meat. Okay? Do you guys like quail? Anybody like quail? You like birds? Um, you know? So he sent quail for them to have meat. And then he sent, supernaturally, he sent bread. Can you guys say Wonder Bread? Wonder bread. Is they still sell Wonder Bread in the stores? Well, this was the first Wonder Bread uh, that was uh, actually given to people in, in our earth. It's Wonder Bread. I call it Wonder Bread because it's miracle bread. So he gave them something to eat. He gave them bread and he gave them meat. Um, and so um, I don't know what kind of birds you guys like to eat, but um, would you guys like to eat pelican? No. Or how about uh, albatross or no. some kind of, anyway. <laughs> the point is he, he, he provided for them, and the people um, begin to see that God had a plan for them all along. He was going to provide for them. And you know, we serve a God that wants uh, to provide for us. So the next time we complain about having to eat liver and onions, we need to know right. that God is trying to make us spiritually stronger Right? And that He always will provide for you. When you think that God, sometimes, does He care because um, I'm stressed out? Why is God allowing this to happen in my life? The next time you have that happen, re remind yourself that God allows stress, right, as a test to see our faith in God. He has the right to test us. You guys go to school. I know you don't like to go to school and take tests, right? Maybe some of you like tests. But sometimes in life, we have to take tests. Because God wants to show us where we're at in our faith, how strong our faith is, and whether we still believe God's good, that He cares, He loves us, and if we're willing to still follow Him, even when life gets tough. That's the stress test. And so God wants you to know He provides uh, for us. He even provides, sometimes when we lack faith, He provides you with more faith. When you just simply cry out to Him and surrender your heart, He will give you that faith. That you need. Isn't that great? He wants to grow your faith. You know what's so cool? I know, kidding, before I came out here, I only had a few little Starbucks, Starburst things like this in my office, and I was like, Lord, we're just going to give the kids crumbs today, I guess. And I had no idea that Kamari was going to bring in this big bag of candy. Is that from you, Patricia? Where'd this come from? But how did you know to bring this today? Did you know we were running deficient and low on candy? You did not know that. that is that not a, a divine miracle this morning of God providing in a devotion about provision? That's crazy. I mean, that is, if that don't stoke your fire, it stoked me. Kamari, man, you're a gift from God. Look at that. He brought that this morning. That is so awesome. Listen, because of uh, Patricia and Kamari, you guys all have candy here now to get... Um, I'm going to ask you all to take a piece, uh, happy, if you're happy and you know it, pass out this candy. So, All right, kids, surround happy and uh, get your candy, and then we're going to close with a word of prayer, okay? All right. Let's go ahead and pray, and then you can go to him after um, I'm done praying. Let's pray. God, thank you for these kids. Thank you for, in live streaming motion, we've just seen uh, you provide during a devotion about provision. Thank you for Patricia and Kamari and that family. Uh, thank you for loving us through them. In your name we pray, amen. Amen.
We're thankful that we got to take a little break, Lord, but there's nowhere like being with our Christian family. Lord, but we did try to speak your name often while we were gone, Jesus. Lord, it's awesome to see all these youth in this church, this assembly church meeting, Lord, because they are the future. And we pray that they keep you in their heart, Lord, and they take what they hear at this church with them when they leave, Lord, not just go out and forget what they heard. Lord, we're glad to see the church filling up. We pray that continues, Lord. And Lord, we ask all this in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't this a beautiful, beautiful day? Amen. I stepped outside to feed my little feral cat that we've been taking care of ever since he's born. And I, I just, I said, golly, thank you, Lord. This is such a beautiful, comfortable day. Yes. Well, y'all have heard me sing this song before because it's one of my favorites. But you've never heard me sing it with Miss Cynthia here beside me. So we're going to sing this together, and we hope we can do it justice as a duet. And uh, when we get on the last chorus, y'all join right in and sing us. Sing with us. You love land, I'm longing for you. And someday.
Thank you, Crystal Gale and um, no, <laughs> Cynthia. I'm just kidding. Patsy, Patsy Klein. All right. Amen. Tim, what, what are you going to go by? So. <laughs> Elvis. Your mother used to call you Elvis. All right. We have a new nickname in the house. That brother wants to go by the name of Elvis. So. <laughs> Tim Elvis Stewart. All right. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all. We are so blessed with so uh, many folks in here that... Um, I'm musically talented, love to sing, play different instruments, and so God has blessed us because music has a way of connecting us to God and reminding us of his truths and to um, inspire us um, and to continue to grow spiritually. Listen, um, today I want to talk about um, being seriously stressed out. Anybody been seriously stressed out? You all feel like you've been stressed to the max? Anybody here last week? Uh, that's, it's pretty common in this life. It's going to happen uh, as we go through seasons of life. But how many of you would say you had a stressful week last week? All right, how about a stressful month? Was last month stress? So in other words, you, it's prolonged. It's beyond the week. It's now in a month. How about a stressful year? Str oh, wow. We got some people not just raising their hands, double hands, people standing up, doing cartwheels uh, over response to that. Listen, I hope, I'm not even going to go and ask if you had a stressful decade. Um, and God forbid a stressful just life, one just one uh, since you were born. It's just been so stressed out to the max. Um, sometimes you wonder how much more you can take, right? How much more of this can I take? You, know, you ever had that question asked? You know, I think we can all relate to one another. I think you like that picture there um, of our um, PowerPoint presentation here. But anyway, listen, the extent of the problem of stress in American society is through the roof. In fact, I want to share with you a few statistics given from mentalhealth.org. And this was in 2018, by the way. That's, this is two years prior to COVID. So I'm sure it's through the roof even further after COVID. Listen, did you know 55% of Americans are stressed out on any given day? 55%. If you compare, they did a rest of the world study, 35%. You'd think some of the third world countries would be more stressed out than us. But in the past year, 74% felt so overwhelmed by stress, they were unable to cope. Felt they were unable to even in function for the day. 51% felt depressed, and 61% reported feeling anxiety because of stress. And listen, if you type in, like I did on this Google search bar, um, these uh, four words, way to reduce stress, I was kind of curious, over 1.5 billion entries popped up. People are looking for answers, folk. And you know what? We have one. His name is Jesus. Listen, I'm not saying that as a Christian that things aren't going to enter your life to test you. Uh, you feel a little rattled. But if you grow spiritually... You'll be able to stave off your spiritual struggles and whatever you're handling, and God can help you meet you at the door with wherever you're at today. Listen, um, psychological effects of stress, 16% had self-harmed, 32% said they had suicidal thoughts, 37% reported feeling lonely as a result of being stressed to the max. And when it comes to our coping mechanisms in dealing with stress, we do things that are dangerous and destructive, folks. In other words, we compound the stress. We multiply it. It's called compound stress, compounding stress. We compound our problems when we do this. For instance, did you know Americans consumed 4.5 million pounds of aspirin in a year? That's more than, uh, for the average person, more than that life was meant to handle. That, that can't take on the stress, aspirin, that you're dealing with. And did you know that we spent more than $10 billion on energy and caffeine drinks? One out of 25 people are using sleeping pills, and 50,000 people died last year from opioid painkiller prescriptions alone. In other words, this is our day. This is our, this is our day for a lot of us folks. We drink three cups of caffeinated coffee in the morning to wake up. Then we drink a five-hour energy drink and monster drinks at lunch to keep us going. And then we pop pills like aspirin, Advil, or opioids in the afternoon to kill the pain to keep us going. And then we smoke a nicotine stick in the evening to calm our nervous fit and finish the day off with sleeping pills to get us a good night's sleep and go back to the routine of three cups of coffee in the morning. Man, we have some really illegitimate and illicit and dangerous coping mechanisms, folks. Listen, behavior effects of stress, 46% report that they ate too much or unhealthily due to stress. A lot of times we call it emotional eating. 29% report that they start drinking or increase their drinking. 
because of stress. 16% report that they started smoking or increased their smoking level because of stress. Listen, 7 in 10 adults, or 72%, have experienced additional health impacts due to stress. In other words, the way we respond to stress can cause more stress, which causes more problems. For example, if we're so stressed out, um, it can cause tension in our organs. Our back can tighten. You ever felt that when you've been stressed out? Back get a little tight, neck gets some headaches, migraines, which can cause long-term health problems, which can cause us to be further depressed and cause additional stress. You see how it um, goes exponentially. For example, let's say uh, you're having a bad day and you heard about the seafood festival being in Moorhead City, uh, like we found out yesterday. And so um, say you think, you know what, I'm going to remedy this stress. I had a stressful week, so I'm going to go to the seafood festival and I'm going to eat at every single food truck and vending tent. I'm going to eat 16 pounds of alligator bites and deep fat fried Oreos and Reese's cups. And so that, uh, then by after doing that, you're going to gain weight and make it harder for your knees, and then you're going to develop other health problems, have knee replacement. I'm not saying everybody has knee replacement surgery to do dog, but I'm just saying you compound stress by mishandling stress. Does that make sense? And so what we try to do in the natural that was meant to do in the supernatural um, isn't enough. And so today I hope that you'll walk away learning how um, you can walk in the Spirit in such a way that the next time you're irritated, next time you're shorter tempered because of stress, because we tend to be quicker to judge others, and then we isolate ourselves from relationships, which further exacerbate the relationship problems. You see how that goes, how the domino effect works on our stress levels? And then more stress, did you know it causes us to have difficulty focusing, we begin forgetful, which leads to making more mistakes, and then accidents happen at work, and then we might get fired. Well, I think I've proven the point there, in that, going down that line of thinking. Listen, America is truly a stressed out society. America is truly a stressed out society. We've lost the, the biblical ability to manage our stress, the spiritual know-how, using Holy Spirit power, which I'm hoping you'll learn to do after today. Listen, we've lost the ability to utilize our faith in God and growing spirituality to shrink and make our stress less. Listen, people today are searching for answers, and the answers are right here. It's in the Bible. It's, it's in Christ. It's in God's Spirit. The answers can be found in the Bible, and in one name, and one name alone, and his name is Jesus Christ. Are you a believer today, folks? Listen, if you've never given your life to Christ, you can do so today. That's the first and best step you can take towards alleviating stress today. Amen. And now we, for us that have Christ, we need to grow in that spirit so we can make stress less. Listen, uh, the Lord gave me a quote I want to share with you. Um, I actually uh, made this up, or I, I believe the Spirit gave it to me, but I was thinking about this um, when I was putting this sermon together. But listen, if spirituality in a society subsides, then stress will soar. But if spirituality returns and soars in a society, then stress will subside. So in other words, if you soar spiritually, your stress will get less. In other words, the way you respond to it. I'm not saying the stressors that are coming at you may decrease. But I'm saying the way you respond to that. That's the key. It's internal work. A lot of it, a lot of what makes us go haywire and, you know, overreact is because of we have some faulty internal mechanisms. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, we're going to look at how one super, supernatural super saint named Paul, the Apostle Paul, how he effectively dealt with stressors in life so he wouldn't, be, he wouldn't become stressed to the max. So we're going to take a look at Acts 18, 1 through 6. I know when I read here, um, if you read along with me, Acts uh, 18, 1 through 6, read along with me. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, and a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. That's, that's pretty stressful, having to leave uh, your home country. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker... As they were, he stayed and worked with them. So Paul was like bivocational, like some pastors, many pastors are. Um, Pastor New Vision, Gerald Baldwin, Pastor Jim Hendricks, uh, they are sort of tent makers, if you will. Uh, people that I am inspired by because they work full time and then they preach on Sunday and minister to their folks all through the week. So they're bivocational. Listen, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. If we can show the map, I'm going to show where we're at here now in this second missionary journey, by the way. If you can just take a look here, we're in what city? Did you read from that text with me? The city of Corinth. You see it over there, the, the left side of the screen there? See Athens right before it? Athens is famous, right? 
for the Olympics and things like that, right? In Athens, Greece. And we know that uh, Corinth, uh, two books of the Bible were written as a result of um, later, as a result of this city and the work of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What two books were those? First and Second Corinthians, right? And so, listen, from this text and from some others, I want to give you three proven stress reducers. Three proven stress reducers today. Here's the first. We have to add, line, add lines to our life. Add lines to our life. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, I already have lines and wrinkles from the stress of life. I don't need no more lines. I'm not talking about those lines. I'm talking about, when I say lines, I'm talking about boundaries. And by the way, these three stress reducers... I'm going to do a little math for you, a simple math formula. I'm going to add some things and subtract some things. So the first thing we need to add to our life is we need to add boundaries to our life. Because sometimes the stress is being caused because we've lost our way in setting boundaries with life. We need to set limits in our lives where we have none or not used to setting with others or even with our emotions. You can talk to yourself and say, and set a boundary with your emotional side and say, you know what, I'm not going to be afraid. I know there's a part of me that's trying to become afraid. I'm telling you right now, I can take, as the Bible said, take captive all my thoughts. So I'm taking you captive, and I'm not going to be afraid in this situation because I'm going to trust God. He's going to provide. I trust he's still good. He still cares. He still loves me. He still has a plan, right? That's faith. That's faith. That's, that's talking. Uh, that's, that's setting boundaries. Listen, we need to, at some points in life, draw the line in the sand with people maybe that we're not used to saying enough is enough. We've got to set boundaries. We've got to set boundaries with people that uh, perhaps are, are toxic or, or unhealthy relationships uh, that are part of our life. That's what Paul did. I'm going to show you uh, from Paul, if we can go back to um, Acts uh, chapter 18. Look at what Paul says here in um, these verses here, if we can bring it back up. If we can look at verse 6. Um, Denise, if you can go to the next slide there. Okay. Okay. In Acts uh, 18.6, he goes, uh, When P Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was a Messiah. But when they, that's the, these Jewish zealots, right? They believed in God, but they didn't believe that Jesus is the Savior, and they didn't believe Jesus was God. They opposed Paul here, it says, and became abusive even. You ever been in an abusive relationship? Listen, he shook out his clothes and protested and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. And guess what? He sets his boundary right here. From now on, I'm only going to go to the Gentiles. He just reduced his ministry. He just cut back. Did you get that? You can look at it that way. Um, that's what he's doing. He's saying enough is enough with this certain group of people. And you know, all of us here this morning, we need to know which limits God is trying to place in our life. We all have limits. All of us only have a certain amount of time in the day. We've all been given the same amount of time. And God has assignments for us during that day. And God doesn't want us to exceed and take on more to-dos than we may be taking on. You may be taking on other people's to-dos. And we're not to take on those to-dos. And so we have to be able to discern through the voice of the Holy Spirit to know what God is asking us and not asking us to do. In other words, we need to embrace God's limits on our life. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Kevin, the Bible says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We should be able to leap tall buildings and, right, and those kinds of things. There are situations God will ask you to do things that seem um, unreasonable and unbearable. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he will always give you the strength this is through his spirit to enable you to do what he asks you to do. So you don't have to fear, fret, um, or be angry about it. Listen, what do I mean by um, adding lines to your life? Uh, I mean God is not going to put more on your plate than you can handle. He's not. In addition, we, maybe, we, maybe we're expecting or depending too much on others for this happy mark to be met that they can't meet. Sometimes we expect other people to come through in a way they, they can't or won't. And so we set up ourselves up for defeat. And so either way, we must set limits and boundaries with others and with ourselves and our expectations in life. So bottom line, we might have to lower expectations for other people. Now you might say, well, you say we should lower expectations of our kids. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about they should do chores. I'm saying that if you depend your happiness to be dependent or contingent on other people to fulfill or come through for you, you may be in a long life of depression. Does that make sense? So we have to set boundaries and what we expect. Listen, Paul, I want to go through here real quickly. Paul had had enough. 
In other words, this wasn't an isolated incident with these Jews. In fact, I did the research, and I'm going to provide it for you here real quick, real rapid fire. Paul had 12 traumatic previous incidents with these Jewish zealots. Let's take a look quickly, for example, because you know, we need to know that you know, you're only meant to handle abuse so much and for so long. Abuse, neglect at the hands of other people. His was with these Jewish zealots. So Paul drew this personal boundary line. He limited the amount that he was going to f- spend in the future. He was going to distance himself, create some space, create some separation from them for at least a time here uh, from them. And as, as, in essence, he's downsizing his ministry. Uh, he's going to redefine and re-clarify his calling. But let's look real quickly. Um, here's the first incident back in Acts 9.23. Real shortly after he was converted, after preaching the synagogue, synagogue that says in Damascus that Jesus is the Son of God, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. You see that? There's incident number one. Here's incident number two. Um, later, it says, when Paul came to Jerusalem speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, they, debating with the Hellenistic Jews, they tried to kill him. So they tried to kill Paul. Number three, third incident, they um, included Paul, came to the island of Paphos and met a Jewish sorcerer named Elymas who opposed them. So there's more opposition, more resistance. Here's incident number four. While at Pisidian Antioch, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, began to contradict what Paul was saying, and what they do? Heaped abuse on him. Fifth incident, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders stirred up persecution against Paul. Sixth incident here. Um, you see here it says the Jews refused to believe. They stirred up other people, poisoned their minds, trying to get other people in a mob to go against them. And there was a plot to mistreat uh, them and stone them. Like that's, that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, stuff to endure, folks, up to this point with one group of people. And then there was a second attack at that same city in Iconian um, that number six showed. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. And incident number eight in Lystra, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. Man, so far, that's just a lot of abuse and uh, torment and persecution going on for one person to handle. And so number nine, it says right here, there was a sharp dispute and debate um, between Paul and these that belonged to the party of the Pharisees, these Jewish zealots, Right? Because of what they're teaching. And then incident number 10 here says they formed a mob, started a riot in the city. And then number 11, they agitated the crowd, stirring them up. And number 12 finally became abusive again. And Paul says, as I said before, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. Listen, I thought, you know, you might say to me, I thought Paul uh, and us are supposed to be open to sharing the gospel with all ethnic groups. Well, here, Paul is uh, saying that his threshold has been met for this season. And this time, you know, the Spirit at one point prevented Paul from going to Phrygia. That wasn't the Spirit's plan. So this season here, Paul is saying, uh, and I believe Paul had permission from the Spirit to um, pull away for a time, to um, refrain and create distance and separation with this group of Jewish zealots. You know, stress has a way sometimes of helping us re-clarify and redefine our call. You know, stress has a way of helping us rethink our life, rethink God's calling, rethinking what he's asking us to do and not asking us to do. Does that make sense? Because Paul does this. Think about this. There was this plan originally um, that Paul, um, he remembers that he was originally called to be a minister to the Gentiles in the first place and primary to them anyway. In fact, let me read a few verses here in Acts 13, uh, 46 through 47. It says, since you Jews reject the word of God, now we turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And it goes on and it says in Acts 9, 15 through 16, the Lord said to Ananias, this man Paul is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. In Romans eleven thirteen, Paul says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in this particular ministry. Romans 15, 16, God called me to be a minister to who? What group? To the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel to them so that the Gentiles might become an offspring acceptable to God, sacrificed by the Holy Spirit. I could give you several others, but just a couple here. Galatians 1, 15, 16, he even says, God set me apart from my mother's womb. What? To do what? To call him to preach to the Gentiles. 
You see that? So over and over in Scripture, Paul is recollecting and he's remembering that, you know what, my original mission was primarily to the Gentiles to begin with. Now, does that mean that he sinned by overextension? No. There's other verses that say that he was also to, to preach somewhat to the Jews, but not primarily. Peter was called to preach to the Gentiles. I mean, Peter was called to preach primarily to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. And so we see this happening. And so I'm just giving a summary here that the beautiful thing about stress in your life and my life, it helps us to rethink our lives. It's God trying to get us to realize perhaps some areas that we're not disciplined in and that we need to redefine and reclarify what it is he's actually asking us to do and not asking us to do. How about you, my friend and family member of God here this morning? How about you? Did, do you ever try to go beyond what God's really asking you to do in the course of a day or week? Are you breaking the limits that God has prescribed and set parameters over your life and therefore you're bankrupting yourself emotionally? Today, where might you... Where might God be asking you to draw the lines, to draw boundaries? They may be old ones that you need to go back and revisit, like Paul being a preacher to the Gentiles. Maybe God's saying, I need you to go back and revisit and think through what things you need to begin to set boundaries with and redraw them. Maybe you need to draw the line this morning with spending habits. Maybe you need to add margins to start exercising. And believe that that really is for everybody, not just for a select few. Maybe you need to create some space or separation in toxic relationships or just uh, some difficult relationships you're having. Maybe you need to adjust the amount of time that you spend on screens. Um, Patrick was sharing at the men's Baptist group yesterday that um, there was an article that came out about teens and screens and how it's caused a lot of difficulty in, in social settings. And, you know, I think when you shared that, I think both teens were on their screens <laughs> as, as we looked around. And so God wants us to relearn some relearn, relearn some social habits that will help us become more engaged and involved. Um, we tried to teach our essential class this morning about how God wants us to have, you know, our ears perked and our eyes uh, straight forward on those that are talking and to take interest in those that are talking because you're more fully engaged. Your attention is not diverted or, or divided. Does that make sense? We, we live in a divided country, folks. We're diverted and distracted and, and diverted. we got all things going on, and, we're, uh, and it's causing us overload. I don't think we're meant to operate the way we operate with screens and things, folks. So maybe God's saying we need to pull back the amount of time we've spent on the screens and those things. Did you know that they surveyed the youth of our generation, and they said one of the things that is one of the top causers of stressors for them is texting and instant messaging. You know why? Because they feel like, like as soon as they get a text, they have to answer right away. Like if they don't answer, they're being rude, they may lose that friendship. And so they're stressed out because they feel they need to respond so quickly. Did you know that? Listen, I believe that stress can also show us that we may need to refine our walk with Christ. Maybe we've lost our way with Christ. Maybe we're no longer walking with Christ. Maybe we're not spending time with him uh, with the amount of time that we need to have stress subsided. Maybe we need to worship him more. Listen, do you realize God has set limits with the amount of time you have in one day and that he won't give you more than you can handle? Listen, I can prove it. Look at 1 John 5, 3 says this. I'm going to prove to you through this verse that God never intended for his daily assignments to emotionally break you or burden you. Here it is. 1 John 5, 3 says what? Read with me. God's commands, assignments, are not burdensome or grievous. Look it up. That verse is in there. 1 John 5, 3 shows us that if we're living overstressed in life, we're breaking the rules of life in some way, and it's revealing one of two things here. We're either breaking limits that God's placed on us, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually, um, or we, you know, because we're adding too many to-dos to our to-do list, or we're overreacting and responding wrongly to a, because of a faulty belief system that's within. Did you know that? That's what God's trying to reveal and diagnose with you. There's some kind of fault line. Think about this. Faulty belief systems are like are like stress lines or fault lines that are located in the tectonic plates in your soul. And you know what tectonic plates, you know what happens if enough stress happens or cataclysmic events, then these stresses on the fault lines can become earthquakes in your life. It can become worse. For example, a faulty belief system, a faulty belief would be, God, God can't help me in this. This is too much. God's not going to help me. God doesn't want to help me. That's a faulty belief. Listen, you must remember four things about God's assignment for your life, and I'll give it to you in a four-letter um, 
four-letter acronym, ABBR. ABBR, God's assignment for you today is achievable, believable, bearable, and reasonable, but not burdensome. Achievable, believable, bearable, and reasonable. Listen, straight, stress is weight placed upon the inner spirit or soul of your life. Like this building here, right now, this building will undergo a lot of incredible stress um, throughout the year from the elements of the weather. And the great thing about this structure is this, it's, it's actually designed to absorb the stress so that the roof and walls will not collapse on our heads. Now, don't look up thinking that, what's he getting at? What's going to happen here? No, I'm honestly not trying to increase your stress level by getting you to think that way. But I'm trying to get you to realize God designed your body and mind in such a way that he's uniquely designed you that you're built for this. Spiritually, especially now that you're born again, you're built for the stresses of life. And so God has fashioned your roof, your, your soul, your heart, your life in such a way that the, the, the master architect and engineer in heaven has carefully studied how to put you together. And when he made you born again, you, he's ensuring that these structures that he's designed you are now safe and that you are able to endure more than your bodies and minds thought you were able to endure. That's what the chapters of faith are all about. And so now listen, you might ask and you might think, now there may be times where life seems unbearable. That's the key word though. That's the operative word. It seems unbearable at the time or in the moment. God's assignments seem unreasonable. They seem unachievable or unbelievable. But that's exactly why he wants you to depend on him. So he gets all the credit, all the glory, and you can get through it. And you think, you know what? That was God that got me through that. He wants to showcase his power, not yours. So if he's going to uh, allow stresses to occur, it's because he's trying to stretch you in your faith to get him to depend more on you and break free and chisel away the flesh. That's what stressors are supposed to serve as. It's a fight between your flesh and your spirit. The spirit man is trying to become developed and is trying to shed the flesh. That's what's going on. God's trying to use stress in your life for that reason. And you've got to understand that the Spirit in a nanosecond can quickly diagnose and show to you what's going on in your heart in that moment, why you're having trouble, and how you've got to change. Are you changing? Are you different this year than you were last year because you're growing spiritually? Listen, the number one plan of the enemy is to attack your spiritual growth. He don't want you to grow. He don't want you to get spiritually stronger because you might actually attack and take on terrain and win people to Christ that you otherwise wouldn't have. Listen, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. So the first thing uh, we need to we can reduce our stress is by adding lines to our life, right? The second thing is a reduction. It's subtract. We need to subtract hidden idols from our life. Subtract hidden idols from our life. Let me explain. Listen, when we want something more out of life than it was intended to give, we have a secret idol. We have a hidden idol. When we become debilitated uh, emotionally or can't function because of some fear of something not happening or not getting something or not receiving something or something being taken away, right? That's where all fears are based, right? Something's not going to happen. If this doesn't happen, then I'm going to be in pain, right? Or something's going to be taken away. Um, that means that we're secretly loving something more than God if we think we have to have that to happen or that be in place. And because when we rely too much on someone or a situation or object to bring us... Um, love or to come through in a way that they can't or don't want to, then we are going to seriously impinge upon our contentment and joy factor that was never meant to be. Listen, in other words, we have hidden idols that we could be worshiping. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, your wife and your sister-in-law, they're best friends, and um, you and your wife decide to go on vacation, and the sister-in-law is left in charge of watching the dog, her favorite dog, and then she lets uh, her daughter, your niece, to walk the dog, and the dog gets tragically hit by a car. And then that causes um, some hardship, hard feelings, because they felt like you shouldn't have let, they shouldn't have let their um, six-year-old niece walk that dog. And then um, there's grudges, and then there's hard feelings and hardship, and there's relational disharmony. And if you think, you know what, um, nobody's talking to each other in this family anymore, there's relational disharmony. If, if you have to think that um, you have to have that relational harmony in place, and you can't be happy until it's in place, then you need to understand God is trying to actually work out holiness over happiness in the lives of people, and people need to forgive one another. We need to understand that if we can't forgive someone, then we are actually elevating whatever that unresolved issue surrounds. That has become the idol. I actually know family squabbles that are still in existence because of a dead pet. They're going on right now. 
because it was left in somebody's care. But what are they doing? What's the idol? It's the animal. It's the dog. They can't get over the loss of the life of that pet. And families stay upset with each other. And so that's an idol. And so you see how idols can secretly get a hold and get in our heart? Listen, when stress has happened, it's like getting on. Anybody had a stress test? It's like getting on a treadmill. They hook you up, right, with these different things. And it reveals where um, there's things in your heart you couldn't see before. You might have thought your heart was okay, but there's things that are revealed. That's what God's trying to do through stress, reveal what idols may be in your heart. Listen, um, there's people that um, put too much in a football game. They'll get, all, you know, get in a, in, a, in a quandary because their team didn't win the championship game. They get more emotionally involved than they should have. And that's self-induced stress because, you know, uh, those outcomes of those games, they don't make things better with your wife. You'll never benefit from the result. Do you know the numerous people that have actually died from watching sports events on television because the stress built up in their body made their heart rate increase, they breathe faster, eyes dilate unnecessarily, and their muscles tighten from getting too emotionally involved? They're breaking limits that God never had intended. In other words, what became their God? Football, the sport that was never intended to be. It became greater than it was meant to be. Listen, I wonder if you, how many here today need to do a stress test in your life and to ask God, what is really going on? What do I need to remove? What's being added that I should never have allowed something to get bigger than it ever should have gotten in my life. Finally, listen, here's another thing you, you need to add to your life, a third, um, a third addition. Add the kingdom of God pursuit over your own personal pursuit. If we're after our own kingdom, it's going to cause you stress because you're not walking with God. You're off track already. And God meant for us to be at peace. And so the key to having peace which is the opposite of being stressed out, is connected to the kingdom and to the church. In other words, how involved are we? Are we involved to the extent we are meant to be? Are we pouring into God's kingdom and not thinking we have to have our own kingdom? Because some people are going after two kingdoms, their own personal kingdom and trying to do God's kingdom. You can't do both at the same time. You can only serve uh, one master, Jesus said. And so peace is connected to seeking God and his kingdom above and beyond our own personal kingdom kingdom, whatever that is. Let me close with this. Uh, the other day I was at uh, Planet Fitness. I was working out and I felt God saying to me, after you get done on the treadmill for 30 minutes, I want you to share the gospel with this guy named Jesse that was working there. And after talking with Jesse for a while, I learned out, he told me he's not religious, but he was interested um, in what I was saying. He would consider what I was saying. And I gave him a track and we went through it. Now here's the point. I could have easily said, you know, I'm tired. I'm not in the mood. Somebody else, you know what, somebody else can share the gospel with him because if Jesse's meant to get saved, God loves him more than I do, so he'll, he'll send somebody else to Jesse and he'll be okay and he'll get saved in the end anyway. <laughs> Threw a lot of theology at you there. A lot of Calvinism. But anyway, where I'm going with this is, if I would have did that, I would actually be valuing my comfort that would have became my idol over a human being. Sometimes we run past people and run past things. I was going to create a list today, but I didn't have time, and put as an insert in the bulletin to think of random acts of kindness and love we could generate to other people, such as if you have the money at the gas station next time, go up and say, hey, I'd like to pay uh, for your tank of your gas. Now, hopefully it's not a big rig, you know, <laughs> but wouldn't that shock somebody, you know, if they had a down week and they're stressed out? Sometimes that can get our mind off our own stress. By helping somebody out, that can actually have a way of infusing energy Spiritual energy and vitality because your mind's off of you and it's on somebody else. Actually helping somebody has a way of taking away stress. Because your mind's not on you no more, it's on someone else. Jesus had you in his mind when he's on the cross. And you know the great thing, folks, about, about what the, we can understand about the cross is this. We don't have to be stressed out if we're going to heaven. We don't have to be stressed out if we're going to heaven. we got the biggest answer resolved and settled at the cross. We know where we're going. Listen, Jesus took on the stress of the cross so we don't have to be stressed out. His arms are stretched out so we don't have to be stressed out. But for the, it's through the supernatural infusion of the Holy Spirit and daily walking with him that he wants to dispense his person, his personhood and his power and his presence into your life so you can walk this thing out and you can face anything and say, you know what, I faced stuff like that before. He's got me through it then. He's going to get me through it now. 
Listen, the Spirit is sufficient to help you stave off our struggles with, I don't care if it's sleep deprivation, I don't care if it's sour relationships, I don't care if your savings account is depleting, I don't care if you feel sluggish spiritually, the Spirit is able to help you meet sufficiently whatever struggle you have today. That's the bottom line. It's how we respond. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know Christ personally, if you've been struggling in your walk, if you are looking for a place to join as your home, to get baptized, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, I don't, whatever you're having, if, if you have COVID for the 18th time, listen, I don't know. There's a lot of people getting COVID for a number of times, and it can wear you down. Listen, God is able to rise up within you and give you that resurrection power. That was the whole point of giving us the Holy Spirit. Grow in the Spirit. Grow in your faith. You come this morning, wherever you're at in life, whatever you're stressed out or facing, I'll be at the front. Sister Cynthia for the women, you know, um, because a lot of times men and women have different issues, struggles that they may feel more comfortable. So that's why we're providing that. You know, whatever you're at, you come. You come this morning. God loves you. He cares for you. He's good. He's still on the throne. He's in control of your life and mine. You come wherever you're at in life. Listen, let's not bear our struggles and our stresses alone. The Bible says bear our burdens with one another. You come. Let's be, let's be here for each other. Let's be a church that's in this together, right? Let's do this. Let's pray. God, we come here this morning. I pray your Holy Spirit would descend and meet us where we are and show us quickly to help us discern what things need to be added and subtracted from our life. It's high time. A lot of us give up some things and start adding things. Lord, show us where those are, which things we need to add, which things we need to subtract. Just show us so we can become more effective and more powerful saints of God. I pray now, Jesus, let the people come wherever they are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to use your hymn book and turn to page 177. And we're going to sing primitive style a cappello as many times as we need to. Um, there's something about that name. Just like Kevin was talking about, sometimes the only word that we even need to speak is Jesus to have the peace that we need. So let's stand and sing that together. 177. It's a very familiar song. Everybody good? Y'all sing with me, not by myself. This is not a solo. Okay. All right. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. something about that name. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. But there
there's something about that name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for loving on God and expressing your love for Him by coming and being part of this fellowship. Uh, one last thing. If you go uh, and go to a gas tank, don't forget to invite Senator Crossroads out of the church. Whoa! I did. I turned it both ways. There, you go. there it is. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to remind y'all to come out Wednesday nights and eat with us. Please remind yourselves, if you're coming every Wednesday night, we'd love to have you. If you come one Wednesday night a month, we still love to have you. Remember... Bring your desserts once in a while. You don't have to bring one every week, but still, please bring a dessert, okay? Because we're going to show up one week and we ain't going to have any. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, we're going to show up and we ain't going to have any. The next thing is, is um, we want to know, Charmaine and I have t talked about it, and we, she has gone online and checked on it, and Operation Christmas shoe boxes, whatever it's called, is in Charlotte, and it's where you can go and pack shoe boxes, and it's November 20th through December the 16th, and it's a four-hour um, thing for packing, and you carry a group, and it's all kinds of groups there from everywhere, and it's just a time, I think, of... Um, fellowship. And I'm sorry, I was brain dead, and that happens often. I don't know if you have to have a brain to go brain dead, but anyway. Um, we would like to know if it's anybody interested in going. If it is, um, let me know so that she, we can go get on, she can go online, and we can all figure out when's a good time to go. We can make it a day trip. We can make it an overnight trip, whatever is best. But we want to see who may be interested in going first so we know which Way to go with it, okay? I should close in prayer. I'm going to nah, back. Thank you. I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you, Father, for letting us be here today. For hearing your word, Lord, we ask you to be with us as we go home today and bring us back again. Um, just keep us safe. Keep us under your, your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.